Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm I'm uh, like I'm Scott Faber. I'm here today with the Environmental Working Group, and I'd like to uh, thank you for joining EWG and the American Enterprise Institute on our briefing on the state of the farm economy. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of your way and let the real experts uh, get started. And uh, but I'll and I believe you have their bios in your kits. I'll do a quick introduction and then we'll turn it over to Vince. So our first speaker um, will be Professor Vince Smith. Vince is a, a visiting scholar at AEI and also a professor of economics in the Department of Agricultural Economics at uh, Montana State University. Um, after Vince, we'll hear from uh, Joe Glauber. Um, Joe is uh, currently a senior fellow at IFPRI. Uh, prior to being at IFPRI, Joe was the uh, USDA's chief economist and a, a special envoy, envoy to the Doha Round talks, and then our last speaker will be uh, Dan Sumner, and uh, Dan is now uh, the Frank H. Buck Professor in, Department of, in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at UC Davis, and uh, has a long career, including uh, time at USDA and, uh, and on the uh, White House Council of Economic Advisors. So I'll, we'll turn it over to Vince to get us started. So, am I on? No, there we go. I'm technologically incompetent. That's what my wife says, and she's entirely correct. Uh, the, the objective today is to provide a sensible understanding of where the farm sector is in terms of its financial, uh, general economic position, and where most farms are. Uh, it is entirely correct, as several speakers at a recent House Agricultural Committee hearing uh, noted, that Farm revenues from sales have slipped from their record highs in, over the period 2011 to 13, quite, quite measurably, mainly because of lower commodity prices. But if you put all of that in context and you look at where the farm sector has been over the last 15 years, the, the point at which the discussion started was record farm income years, which were very atypical from a longer run perspective. So, for example, in, uh, in 2012, net farm income as reported by uh, USDA was around about $100 billion. And today, net farm income as reported again by USDA is $55 billion, and that's a substantial decline. But if we put it into a slightly different context, uh, and we ask the following question, um, over the decade 2001 to 2010, which included early in the decade periods of low prices for some commodities like corn and wheat, and high prices for those commodities. So we've had, for those two commodities, difficult times and very, very lucrative times, to just to be, to be fair, turns out that in inflation-adjusted terms, using $2,009, so I'm going to have a slightly different number for the current estimate of farm income now because I've adjusted for inflation. Uh, over that 10-year period, net farm income averaged $75 billion or close to it, with a low in 2002 of $43 billion and a high in, 2010, uh, in 2004, sorry, of just over $100 billion, so lots of fluctuation. And that's normal in a world where commodity prices are volatile. Um, and, and the average was $75 billion. In those dollars, um, net, farm income to, uh, net farm income today is forecasted to be for, the, for 2015, because the final numbers are not yet in, Around about 62 billion, and uh, for this for, for the 2016 year, around about 61 billion. So lower than the 10-year average, up to the boom, incredible boom years, to be truthful, of uh, 11, 12, 13, um, and to some extent 40. Uh, but right back within the normal range, and and certainly not by any means the lowest we've seen. Now. If we look at net cash income rather than net farm income, which really shows a better picture of cash flow, because it's pretty easy to measure um, cash expenditure uh, uh, costs and, and cash income, um, 
It turns out that the high net cash income was about 135 billion in 2012, and now we're at about just under 90 billion. Um, that's a much different picture. Um, and that 90 billion uh, number on net cash income is actually above the 10-year average for the previous decade. So what was happening in the, in, in, the, in the years from 2001 to 2010 to a, a key financial indicator, that is the debt to asset ratio, the, the average debt to asset ratio in the farm sector? Well, it was actually declining. It was declining from around about 15% uh, to a low of about 11% in 2013, and it's now uh, at, at, at just under 13%. So we're at near record lows in terms of the, the, the debt to asset ratio, which means the capacity of the farm sector as a whole to manage year-to-year -year fluctuations in their revenues, and that's inevitable in, a, in such, a, such an industry. Um, is, is at, at near record levels. Um, borrowing uh, from the farm credit, uh, fr from the Farmers Home Administration, by the way, uh, they make loans to distressed farms, uh, has gone up in the last year. It is currently 1.5% of farm income. Farm income from, from cash receipts is around about $380, $390 million, billion dollars a year. Um, and uh, borrowing from F F the, the USDA's loan operations is around about $6 billion today. Now, that's up, and if you say, what did it go up from? Well, two years ago, it was about $3 billion, so it's doubled. So that means that there are 1.5% of farm output associated with those borrowings. Still very modest. Um, if you look at cash receipts from farming, um, in both nominal and real terms, they are lower than at their peak of 400, 410 million billion dollars, but they're still very high. And if you just take a look at that cash receipt nominal or cash receipt inflation adjusted picture, you can see the trend is upward. And, they, and the truth is we're not that far below trend, uh, where trends are up, not down. Now, costs are generally up um, since uh, the early 2000s. Um, energy prices did go up a great deal. Fertilizer prices went up, and they did not go down a whole lot in the last two years, even though natural gas, which is the key input into fertilizer production, is at record lows. But it's a, it's a complex little market, is the fertilizer market. So fertilizer prices are higher uh, by about 80% than they were in the mid-2000s. But if you put the whole picture together, um, costs have gone up not that much differently than the general level of inflation in the agricultural sector. Um, and if you look at farm household income, uh, and Dr. Glauber is going to drill much more carefully down into those numbers than I will, you can see that farm household income is well above uh, the rest of the economy's average household income. Um, uh, by a substantial amount. Um, in terms of net worth, the average farm's net worth um, is, you can argue about the numbers, but it's around about $800,000 to $900,000. That's the average farm. The average citizen's net worth, depending on how you want to measure it, the average is about $180,000. If we knock out uh, the, the top and we just look at the median, uh, the median net worth is in 2011 was around about $80,000. So net worth in, uh, for the average farm is roughly eight to ten times more than that of the average citizen. And if we drill down to where the subsidies that come under the farm bill go, you know, what is current, who, who are the farmers' current policy is helping? The answer is that 80% of all subsidies go to the largest farms. These are farms characterized as high wealth, high income farms by USDA. And the overwhelming majority of the subsidies go to high wealth, high income farms and farm households, where it takes a great deal of effort to believe that they're on the verge of bankruptcy and can't cope with even two, three, or four years of difficult financial times. 
So uh, having said all that, um, I'm going to, to wrap up. And, and we promised that we would, need, none of us take more than eight minutes. And I think I'm about 15 seconds into that. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Glauber, who will discuss in much more detail farm household income. I'll just shut that mic off. See if that works. Yeah, no, it's on. I, I got this one on. Okay, uh, no, thanks, Vince. Um, uh, Vince asked me to, if I could put the current uh, farm income uh, situation in, in a historical context. Um, largely, I, I've been working the last few months on a, on a chapter on U.S a chapter that's going in a book on U.S. agricultural policy. So it's given me an opportunity to kind of look back and, and do some of the analyses. They have copies of these, I believe. There's a, in your chart package. I'm going to go through some charts uh, like any dull economist, uh, but I'll try to walk you through them. Uh, as Vince said, the, um, I'm going to start with, with instead of net farm income, I'm, I'm going to start with net cash income. and. Uh, I like net cash income. I think when I was chief economist, I always talked in terms of net cash income, maybe because it's simple and I can understand it, but it is exactly what it implies. You, have your, you take your receipts, you take any government payments you, you make, you take any not, um, a farm related income, and those, that's all your gross receipts, and you subtract out costs. What it doesn't include, and what is included in net farm income, is depreciation. So uh, what I think ERS terms is capital consumption, but essentially um, uh, there you can have some, a, a couple things that are in net farm income are things like changes in inventory. So if you added cattle in a given year or, or if you took, drew down stocks, those are changes in inventory that get adjusted into the, the income. And, and we want to kind of smooth away all that. Um, and then the other thing is depreciation. You know, we had a lot of equipment purchases in 2011, 2012. We had a lot of money. Uh, the, the sector uh, saw a lot of revenue come in. Uh, you know, they, they were able to, to buy a lot of machinery, which hopefully improves productivity. But unfortunately, when you look at that in terms of net farm income, that shows huge negatives on net farm income. And that's one of the reasons why net farm income and net cash income have, have diverged a lot. So I want to kind of normalize that and just kind of talk about net cash income. And my first chart, again, the, the, the numbering on the chart reflects the, the uh, I should have cleaned that up, but that, that reflects uh, charts out of this, this uh, chapter I'm writing. But it, it, it echoes what Vince said. If you go back a long time, you can see, and, and then adjust for inflation like I've done, everything's in uh, 2009 terms, you can see that income, uh, you know, what, what we've seen over the last couple of years is a reversion kind of to that long run average, which has been around 80, uh, um, uh, uh, $80 billion, excuse me. Um, for net cash income. You can see the changes, however. There's a lot of volatility in net cash income. There's no question about that. There's, it's pretty much, I mean, this goes all the way back to the, the 30s, and you can see it particularly during those early, uh, during the Great Depression when you, you had such large uh, drops in net cash income. But really, since World War II, we've seen pretty flat um, uh, net cash income, with the exception of some very key years. Uh, the early 70s, we saw big price spikes and, and record incomes. And, and those really are the adjusting for inflation record income levels back in the early 70s when we saw these uh, uh, big grain deals to the Soviet Union and, and, and other things. And then more recently, the, as Vince mentioned, the um, uh, big revenue increases we saw in 2012 and 2013, where we hit record levels. Um, uh, so if you look at, at the, the other chart that I think a lot of people look at as is sort of the percent of government payments as a percent of gross and net cash income, and you can see for at least on gross income, it's remained pretty much below 5% for a number of years now, and certainly has trended down a lot since the, those big payments that were paid out at the end of the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Now, I want to I move over to uh, another uh uh, some other measures, and here I, I think, uh, having looked at the, the testimonies that were done in, in the, the House just uh, a few weeks ago, I, I think some of this was, I think, covered by uh, uh, my successor, uh, Rob Johansson. 
but looking at net cash uh, or, or at farm household income, then that, that really shows a slightly different picture. And, and I'm going to walk you through a few charts to just show how that has evolved. And there you've seen generally, again, adjusting for inflation, trending up of, of the mean uh, farm household income, uh, again, a, a adjusting for inflation at around $120,000. Uh, and, and even if you look at median household income, that too has trended upwards uh, again, um, such that both mean and median are well above the median household income for all households. Now, the other big thing that has really uh, the, the, uh, the striking trend has been uh, what is in uh, figure, the uh, numbered figure 11, and that is the declining share of farm income as a percent of total farm household income. Figure oh, it figured that five, I see. Uh, uh, someone was better than me and, and actually, re I, I have my, the, the draft I sent those guys, so <laughs> they're, they're smarter than I am. So, uh, so I'm looking at uh, figure five, and that's showing farm income as a percent of total farm household income. And you can see that has declined significantly. It, it certainly was the case in the early 60s that almost half the income that it was made by farm families came from the farm. And if you turn to the next, uh, 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 the next uh, chart, which would be figure six, that you can see that, that what the impact has that has been. If you look at farm income, and there I'm looking at just the farm portion of the uh, farm household income, that has an enormous variability. I mean, that's what people focus on. It, it here, you know, I, I took just the, the, uh, a measure of the, the, the variation of that income from year to year, about 40%. And that's quite high. But if, if you then look at total household income, and that, of course, includes the off-farm work and other sorts of things that, that people bring into there, that smooths that considerably. And, it, and again, down uh, uh, to the uh, uh, standard deviation of around 12% or so. And, and again, very similar, I might add, to uh, household income levels or change in household incomes for all households. And then lastly, just picking up what, what uh, part of what Vince had talked about, and that is the distribution of farm payments. And this shouldn't be a surprise, uh, the, since so many of the payments are based on historical base acres or historical uh, 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 production on the farm or on actual production, that these things tend to go to farms that have a lot of production. And so the, the, the payments tend to be skewed. Uh, and, and you can see here, at least in the last table, um, and I apologize, the, the numbers are small for me to read, but, but let me just walk you through, say, for 2013. What's, what that is saying is that 75% of the payments are going to farm households that had farm household income greater than $66,000, okay? Um, and, and that 10% actually of, of payments went to farm households that had more than a million dollars of payments in 2013. Now, some of this is, is the, the, the current farm bill has tried to get at this a little bit more on, on means testing. But again, this is, just shows you that the, 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 a lot of these payments are going to farms that have incomes higher than the median income of all households. And I show that number down there as well. And in fact, um, uh, just going back through the ERS numbers, um, you, can, you can see that about 73% in 2013, at least, 73% of the payments went to households that earned more than, than um, uh, 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 total farm, uh, who had more household income than, than the average household income uh, of all uh, the population. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to Dan and can get questions later, I guess, right? Yeah, so I am, uh, I'm not going to, mention a single number. I think you've got plenty of numbers. They're all written in these charts and tables, so I'm not going to talk about numbers. I do think to try to appreciate uh, why we have farm programs to start with, uh, we ask, we, we have to, and, and what do all these numbers mean? We have to ask why do we have these programs? And I start off by saying, uh, of course farm subsidies go to the largest farms. That's the way it has to be designed. That's why we have the programs. And if they didn't, that'd be a terrible mistake because farm subsidies cannot be a poverty program in America. 
Maybe they were in 1930. I doubt that, frankly, uh, when farms were poor relative to everyone else and, and when there were lots and lots of very poor farmers. Maybe farm subsidies could be uh, help for the poor in Burkina Faso, where there are lots of very, very poor farmers, but not in the United States. Uh, if it were ever true, it quit being true uh, before I ever studied uh, farm programs, and that was before most of you were born. So, so we should just get out of the notion that farm programs can be used for poverty alleviation. Now, the USDA contributes a lot to poverty alleviation through food stamps and the WIC program and school lunches and lots of things. Uh, so I'm not saying, g given that those programs are part of the Department of Agriculture and under the jurisdiction of the House Ag Committee, those are very important poverty programs, but not the farm subsidies. They can't be that. And so there, if, if you want to ask why we have them, it's not to help poor people. Set that off the table. It's got to be for some other reason. It's got to be that you think there's something wrong with markets for agricultural commodities. There's something wrong with those markets, and for particular agricultural commodities. That is, uh, grains and oil seeds, cotton, uh, a little bit of around the fringe of other things. So that is, we think the market for eggs and poultry and, and cattle and hogs and uh, tomatoes and peaches are just fine, but there's something really screwed up about the markets for uh, these other commodities. Or, I mean, that's got to be a rationale underneath these programs. And in part, that could, I mean, this is real life in America. This could be a historical accident. There was something about what was going on in the 1930s when these things were invented. And what that brings, and, and I think that's sort of the story. It's not that somebody has gone to a scholar like uh, Joe Glauber and said, explain to us why it is the case that cotton or soybeans or, or corn markets are so screwed up, but the markets for peaches and, and, and uh, the commodities where I'm from in the middle of California, why are those commodities, why are those markets so well functioning relative to these others? I don't think anybody's really, nobody in Washington said, uh, tell us the answer to that and that's why we have these programs. I think it's more historical. I think we went through a history where uh, these commodities that uh, lots of the farms were integrated, lots of the livestock was on a farm that also grew corn, and so you subsidize the corn side or regulate it in some way. Uh, second, so, so that's one thing. I think it's sort of a historical accident and it's been going on for 80 years. Uh, I've often said, in fact wrote a piece for the American Enterprise Institute a generation ago saying, uh, I, w I went through th 12 reasons, 12 reasons why you might think you have farm programs, none of which seem to hold water economically. And I came to the bottom line with the 13th of the 12 reasons, which is we have these programs because we've always had them. And, and I don't mean that as a joke. I mean that very seriously. Uh, generations of farm families, uh, 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 cotton families from Lubbock, Texas, uh, the farmer who's there now, his granddaddy had these kinds of programs. Not identical programs, they've evolved, but they've been there. And that farmer will legitimately say uh, to Vince Smith, I'm sorry, you can draw, draw as many supply and demand curves you want on your blackboard, but these programs have always been there, and my whole uh, uh, industry, as far as I know it, has, has evolved around these programs. Now, if, 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 if that's the reason, you say, gee, we don't have any other reason other than we've always had them, uh, and we're spending a lot of money, M maybe, it's, maybe you can do something about that. And I, that's where I come down, is that maybe 80 years are, is long enough, and that you can make some adjustments now uh, to, to, to remove these. And, and to be fair, we've done a lot over the last few decades to evolve programs to be less affecting of markets, to, to be a smaller share of uh, farm revenue, things like that. Uh, I think it's now a time when we can go the next step, so to speak. Uh, but, but that leads us, so, so if we thought about taking the radical option, gee, we've done this long enough, let's, let's unravel this, uh, you have to come back and say, well, and, and there's a whole series of objections. We, we've dealt with the poverty issue. It's not a poverty program, so it's not like we're going to throw people into poverty uh, uh, by unraveling these programs. But what about food security? 
Uh, and we could go through a, a list of data. I could throw out a bunch of numbers about food security. The fact is we subsidize products that we tend to export. Uh, we subsidize uh, uh, cotton, among other things, which we, most of us don't eat. Uh, we, we, subsidize, we, we don't subsidize the sort of products that most nutritionists say would encourage many of us to eat more of, for example. So it, it just doesn't, that, that argument sort of fades away. Um, what about innovation? Don't we want more innovation in America? Well, we tend to subsidize the very tradition, most traditional of the products in the most traditional growing areas on the most traditional farms. If anything, I, I think everybody would acknowledge that the traditional farm programs stifle innovation as opposed to encourage it. There's nothing about them that, uh, USDA again does lots on agricultural innovation, but it's not the farm programs. Um, and, and then I, I think I do want to finish then with a, with a final observation, and that is uh, there, there are people uh, who think that there's something just fundamentally flawed with markets in general. No market can, be, can operate. The government really needs to micromanage the economy every step of the way, uh, really throughout the economy. And there are people running for president that think that. Uh, and and uh, we don't have time to deal with that here, but it is a little odd that agricultural markets that tend to be, if, if there's anything in Econ 1A when I teach that course that I say, gee, here's traditional economics, supply and demand, it tends to be agricultural commodity markets, to think that those are the ones that can't function, whereas lots of other markets uh, uh, have, have less government intervention, uh, is a little bit odd. So uh, I won't address with the, the idea that we ought to have the government micromanaging the economy in the way that, for example, my favorite example is North Korea, where they really micromanage the economy every step of the way, including agriculture. Uh, it's a little odd to think that we want to go that route in the United States, but, but to the extent that that seems like a good idea, uh, some agricultural commodity programs are, are well along that, that line. Let me stop there. Uh, I just wanted to take the few minutes that uh, Vince allowed me to get, bring us back to the fundamentals. Uh, why do we have these programs in the way that we have them? Why do we focus them on traditional commodities grown in the traditional way in traditional places? Why do we think that we need to uh, micromanage the agricultural economy and not everything else in the economy? And, and finally, that uh, if, if we're concerned about poverty and income distribution, these, it's, it's not a matter of putting on this payment limit or that targeting. The programs fundamentally can't go there. They're just not designed as poverty programs. And, and we should uh, uh, toss that one out the window uh, a long time ago. All right, great. Over to you, Thank Scott. You. All right, thanks. thanks to all of our experts. So we'll uh, throw it open to you for your questions. <laughs> Sir, right, right here in the second row, third row. Dr. Glover, I have a question for you about you know, the comparisons to median household income for farm producers. And I wonder if, if that is a fair comparison given that farmers are not employees of larger corporations. They're small businesses. They employ people themselves. So would a more accurate comparison be comparing farmers to business owners of an equal size? So, so to paraphrase you, yeah. while these guys confer, your question is <laughs> com compare farmers to other small yeah. businesses. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I think that's I think that's legitimate. But I, I think you'd find there too that, that I mean you talked about other I mean to, in one sense that almost makes their point that is you're not providing a lot of subsidies to the shoe store operator down on Main Street, and they and it's true that they Joe, may have to microphone. Oh, sorry. Okay. I had it on. I think when you turn on these others, it negates. The question was: Is the is the um, comparison to all far, all households in the U.S. a legitimate one? Shouldn't you be focused on households that that of, of small business people? Is that that was essentially it? And, and I. Well, I, I think on the asset side, for sure, I, there's no question. I mean, that, now, it, it's a legitimate question. 
if you're providing subsidies, I think, to ask that question about whether or not you should be providing, if someone has an asset base of X, whether or not you should be providing that. But, but you're right, if you were looking at, at other small business, uh, families of other f small businesses, yeah, that would be a more apples to apples type comparison. But I don't, the fact that you're providing federal dollars to this, I think, is, is a hook that I think can't be ignored in one sense. Because, I mean, after all, these things in the 30s, you know, were, they were justified two ways. One is they wanted to get income out to people to spend money, right? Because everything, I mean, you, you give someone some money and he's going to turn around and buy something at the store, you know, in town, and that's going to be good for the store in town. They're going to spend money. But the other thing was the fact that rural income or farm income was, you know, we're talking 40% of what total household income was elsewhere. And so that has been a metric that has been used in the past, and I think that's one reason why ERS has had those things. But you're raising a great question. Apples to apples. Should you be looking at that? That would be an interesting comparison. But I would say there, then you also have to consider if it's... The small businesses receiving subsidies in the form of tax breaks, things like that. Well, that's true with the entire economy is that we have a lot of tax breaks and things like that. These are explicit dollars that go to a specific, uh, that, that we justify for whatever reason, we give it to, to, to farmers. I'm just saying that, that there are a lot, you know, I, 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 I'm sensitive to shoe stores. I, I, my, uh, uh, my family ran shoe store, uh, not my, my father, but his, his father had a shoe store that dates back to the 1850s. Went out of business in 2007, but had to, had to go through all sorts of recessions, had to go through, uh, uh, had to take competition when they built a freeway near the house so everyone could go to Louisville, Kentucky, eastern suburbs of Louisville to buy shoes, stayed through that, and, and finally, you know, Walmart beat them out of business. You know, but the fact is, these guys face a lot of risk too. I'm not sure that he had quite the same sort of uh, uh, aid he had that he had on his tobacco base, because he also has some, uh, my uncle at least had some tobacco base as well, which was uh, good for his shoe store. But uh, yeah. So, so we actually have data on wealth that were put together by, by USDA. It turns out that small businesses on average have a lower net worth at the, at the median level than the farm sector does, while facing, the truth is, while facing the same risk. And there's some data in, in, in the handout on bankruptcies. So the average bankruptcy rate uh, over the last 20 years annually in the farm sector has been back of the envelope estimated at about a half a percent, about one in 200 farms. Small business failure rates uh, 50% of businesses do not last more than seven years. Um, and the data are, are, are in the handout on the small businesses. The data on farm bankruptcies are very incomplete, uh, courtesy of uh, an administrative decision in the early 1980s uh, to terminate reporting by USDA of farm bankruptcies and farm failures under the Reagan administration, because they were actually going up a little bit. But today, bankruptcies in the farm sector, and we're talking about all two million farms now, not just the very successful commercial farms, run in the small numbers of thousands, uh, less than 10,000, less than 5,000. Uh, so if you think about 5,000 farms going out of business through bankruptcy annually, which is around as best we can guesstimate because of the lack of data um, where you're at, as opposed to two million farms in the industry, you get a sense of, of, of how actually financially secure relative to other business sectors and comparable small business sectors farming turns out to be. Question in the back. I, do, I think it'd be good to come back to the wealth question, but it's, I think it's confusing the question that was asked because, I mean, you gave a wealth answer, but to the question that was asked of Joe about income, to follow up on that, you know, when I drive to work, you know, I've got opportunity costs, I've got a car to get here, but otherwise I'm deploying no capital in the production of income, which is my salary, right? I'm a salary, but virtually everybody else in this room, we're salary employees and we're not deploying capital or putting it at risk. And so I think that's, 
go to the first question, kind of the follow on that's related to that is, Joe, can you provide some context for the value of cap the capital that's being put at risk in the production of that income? Because we're, we're pretending like a household salaried income is equivalent to a farm household income where they're, you know, for a $70,000 salary, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars are they having to put at risk, often borrow on a short-term operating loan to produce that income? Well, I, you're absolutely right about um, uh, if you're comparing it to total household income or, you know, the average for all household income. I think the small business thing, certainly you have, uh, there's a lot of capital at risk for small businesses. And, and certainly with small businesses, they go in and out of production all the time. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's pretty clear. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, there is, although... That really depends a lot in the sector. Uh, I mean, you can find a lot of farms that have very little debt and, very, and that look not too much unlike households here, I might, I mean, you know, of, of salaried employees, and largely because they do bring in a lot of, of farming or off farm income from other sources, both salaried and, um, you know, investment income and things like that. Setting aside the debt scenario, then, just in general, what kind of capital are they putting at risk in the production of that? I mean, if we're looking at a comparable, a sal uh, you know, an $80,000 salary versus an $80,000 farm income, what is the differential on value? Of well, I mean, you're talking about a net worth that probably, the net worth probably doesn't look that much different than a lot of uh, uh, households uh, with, uh, you know, I mean, you're, 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 the net worth situation, I mean, at least debt as a, expressed as a percent of net worth is all I'm saying. And, and certainly, uh, you know, people have a lot of, you know, if you're, if particularly if you're, uh, I mean, you know, salaried employees, yeah, sure. They get, they get, a, as long as they're keeping their job, um, and, and that's easier in the federal government than it is uh, certainly if you're getting paid in the private sector where you can get, you know, you can lose a job pretty quickly if there's a downturn or whatever. But, I mean, you think about people that have home mortgages. I mean, there's a lot of people with that have s significant amount of debt with, you know, relative to their net worth. I mean, relative to their, their assets, I'm sorry. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I can, I don't know if it, it's, I, I don't know if I buy the argument that it's, oh, they, they have so much more uh, exposure issues than, than other people in, uh, in society, because I think there are a lot of comparables there. But, but to, let, let's get back to the, I mean, if we're talking about, uh, I, I can't quite tell what the argument is. We, we, uh, pe people who have debt um, have, uh, in farming anyway, incredible amounts of equity. So it, it's certainly true. If you take take a thousand thousand acres of corn in Iowa, uh, somebody that owns half of that is is sitting on, and and most own at least that, uh, are, is sitting on about five million dollars worth of equity, and will have loans. There's no question about that. So let me clarify that. Yeah. Earn my salary. There is no cost of production that I'm laying out, right? My salary is, is a, assuming you meet the threshold Joe mentioned, my salary is guaranteed income to me. If I'm the, if I'm the farmer that's earning $100,000 worth of income that you're comparing to my salary, they may have generated a million dollars worth of sales in generating that 100,000, but it also means that they had to outlay $900,000 worth of input costs with no guarantee that that million dollar revenue would come back in. And so my point is, your outlay, your value at risk is that 900,000 bucks that you're laying out there to generate a- So, so, so let's stop right now. Just, just let's stop it. Yeah. Um, the bottom line is, I can take any mid-sized business and tell exactly the same story. Uh, just a minute, you, you, excuse me, you have had a lot of time speaking to us, so let, it, let me allow, allow us to respond and then move to someone else. The bottom line is that you're trying to A, compare apples to oranges. So the apple to apple comparison for, the, just, just a minute, just a minute, please stop interrupting as we're trying to respond, okay? Is that, is that okay? Everyone agrees that Vince should be able to respond, so... Right. So, so, so uh, I remember several years ago when you raised the question about volatility of farm income, and you didn't like my answer then, and you're not going to like my answer now, and I apologize for that. 
But the, here's the real deal. The real deal is that any business, my, my uncle ran a toy company in England, running a private, in, running a private firm in England in the 50s and 60s was a real challenge. Uh, um, his costs were 95% of his revenues. That was the deal. That's very typical. What he did not have the privilege of, because he was trying to grow a business that was not heavily asset-based, was substantial equity to manage year-to-year -year volatility. Many companies do have substantial equity. It's time to stop thinking about a farm as a farm and start thinking about it as a firm. And as a firm, many, many operations where they know their revenues are volatile from one year to the next will have substantial equity. That's what you see in the farm sector. Many firms will have multiple lines of revenue, some stable, some unstable. Uh, that is exactly what Joe told you about uh, the farm household. The farm revenue, which is only a part of the total household revenue, is relatively volatile. Uh, the other part of the revenue may be extremely stable. Uh, fa farms are not, are not magic entities. They are firms. When they're well managed, and most farms are well managed, they're going to be structured to manage the volatility in their sector. That's what farms do. One of the biggest challenges that we have, in fact, in agricultural policy is that by trying to get rid of the volatility, we encourage A, lack of innovation, which is what Dan was talking about earlier. B, we encourage people to behave fiscally less responsibly in managing their businesses. And there's plenty of evidence for that. So let, thank you, thank you. Let's hear from someone else. Sir, the bearded gentleman in the back. Uh, yeah, can you explain more about the lack of innovation and you know what, I'm not really, really quite understanding it because I think from um, the farmers I talk to every day, regulation is what's cycling a lot of the lack of innovation and how farmers want access to the latest and greatest traits or technology that's better for the environment using less chemicals and fertilizers where you have USDA that approves a trait and EPA sits around for three years waiting to approve the corresponding chemistry. So I, this, whole, this whole argument that you make about innovation being cycled because of the government is not necessarily on the subsidy side, but more on the regulation side. You know, if you, if, I don't know when the last time you talked to someone who gets up every morning and put food on your table was, but the number one thing that they're going to say is regulation is what's, is what's really hurting them. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's true in every industry, uh, certainly every agricultural industry, including those that get no subsidies whatsoever, uh, so or, or very little subsidy. Uh, the point I was making uh, was, uh, and, and so are, are there things that the U.S. government does to stifle innovation? No question about it. Um, and, and some of that relates to environmental regulations. Is the, are there other things that stifle innovation? And I would say the way we structure our farm subsidies also do that. So that if I'm uh, in Northern California, traditionally grown rice, uh, over the, in the past, uh, 50, 60, 70 percent of the gross revenue of a rice farmer can be from farm subsidies. Now we're in the 10 or 20 percent range in, an, in a normal year. Uh, that's compared to the 47 or 57 other crops that that farmer might consider in the rice belt in California. And the farmers that I talk to, just about every day, in fact, because I live among them, uh, is, is that uh, what keeps them from shifting across crops and from changing within crops is a set of subsidy structures that are designed, in our case, uh, 3,000 miles away and that that does limit the kinds of things that farmers can do to, to respond to markets. Now, is it the only thing? Obviously not. Uh, it's one of the things. And in fact, uh, I'll, I'll uh, reinforce this even further to make the point that uh, what, what I find uh, troublesome is that a number of the innovations that the farmers that I know are engaged in are in fact innovations to deal with either regulation or subsidies. So that is to say they innovate in designing their business operation to still be eligible for subsidies when they bump into this or that 
regulation that's designed to, 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 to target the subsidies of one entity and another, or, and, and this is even worse, innovate in responding to various environmental regulations that don't necessarily make a lot of sense down on the ground. So that, for example, here in California where we have a cap and trade system and, and uh, some offsets for farms to contribute to some local California greenhouse gas rules, a lot of the innovation in agriculture is shifting what they do on the farm that may not have any real impact, but it does meet uh, the sort of regulations in this case coming out of Sacramento. But there are similar things with the, with the federal regulations that farmers have to do. Uh, and it's, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of innovation, it takes capital to meet those. And things that might otherwise done, uh, be done to innovate to meet market forces or, or innovations that farmers have to do to meet regulations or to comply with subsidy programs and rules surrounding subsidy programs. Yeah. The only thing I would add is just echo what Dan had said earlier, that is, it's changed a lot. I mean, it, it's, it's, at least on that side, I mean, you think back 30 years ago when you, if you had corn base, you planted corn. And so it really throttled any sort of innovation there. And, it, and, and I think, you know, if you look at the farm bills from 85 on, or particularly 90 on, you know, with, with keeping planning flexibility and those sorts of things, I think those things have, have been really key um, and, and, and really help minimize the sort of distortions that, that we really used to see in those farm programs. I mean, I, Dan and I might dis disagree in terms of the, the degree of, of distortions that are still in these programs, but there is still dif distortions in them. But you're absolutely right on the regulatory side. I think there, there you do see uh, real issues, I think, and, and issues that need to be you know, uh, thoughtfully uh, looked at and addressed. So I live in the middle of nowhere too. Uh, I'm not sure what your middle of nowhere is. Mine is Bozeman, which is less the middle of nowhere in Montana than most places, but it's a long way from anywhere. Um, yeah, the, the farmers and ranchers I know are the salt of the earth. Uh, there was a comment in the House hearings about critics of farm subsidies not understanding farmers or not knowing farmers, and that's simply certainly not true for Dan. It's certainly not true f for Joe. You could levy it at me because I grew up in the city of Leeds, but I've been privileged to spend the last 20 years in Montana, and it's been a, a real joy. And just as an aside, many of the farmers I know recognize the distorting nature of many of the farm substances they get, and they're very honest in private, certainly, and even in public about that. Um, the ranching community uh, is a very different animal. Uh, receives far fewer subsidies. Essentially, the, the one sort of direct subsidy that, that you get out of the crop insurance program is forage insurance, which many people in my world sign up for. Um, but it's not a lot of money compared to what the corn guys get out of that program, for example. Um, and, and then there's the disaster aid program, which is one of the few innovations in the last few years that have been deliberately designed to be WTO compatible. And that, that's a compliment to the work, the, the, the recognition of, of ranchers, most of them, uh, of the importance of export markets and import markets. It's just tremendous. The, the bottom line is that many of the subsidies that farmers get that, that we've been talking about, if they went away, would fundamentally not change production in any measurable way. Um, when it comes to new and beginning farmers, to facilitating change in the industry in terms of personnel, this is old, it's dull, but the bottom line is you want to invest in good education for those farmers, both, both agronomically, with respect to animal science, with respect to finance and economics. Uh, so the programs that, are, that provide genuine public goods in the form of education opportunities that flow 
and I apologize, I'm speaking as a land-grant person, but out of the land-grant uh, university, that and maybe everybody but the economist is more useful in that, that, that domain, but those sorts of programs are, I think, are, are valid. Facilitating people's entry into the industry is important. Um, there is an argument that is put forward by quite a few economists, many economists, that the current farm subsidy programs mitigate against new entry by raising the value of assets, by raising the wealth of, that the farmer, farmer possesses. So it makes entry into the industry more expensive. If you look at how entry occurs today, you know, when I look at the kids who graduate out of our agricultural business program, what I see often is that they will take a job in a different area, say the farm credit system, which is quite lucrative, um, uh, especially if you're competent. Um, and then they'll buy a quarter of a section a couple of years later, and they'll build up. And that's literally how we see entry occurring. Some of those people don't need any help. Um, I can make a case, and, and I'm not saying that, that the rest of the panel would agree with me, for support for beginning farmers, um, for education, uh, perhaps for preferential loans for entry at a, uh, into farming on a part-time basis, which is how many people, very well-educated people but young, enter into farming. Those sorts of things are important. Critically for the sector as a whole, for it to remain highly competitive, we need to invest perhaps a lot more than we have in agricultural R&D, in the development of new technology that people then have an incentive to adopt. Um, those seem to me to be the big areas. Time for one more question. You mentioned the beginning farmers and how the subsidy program impacts those. Could you elaborate on how um, you were not talking much about crop insurance, but crop insurance subsidies and, and subsidy programs raise barriers to beginning farmers and new entrants trying to get into farming and how that actually happened? Well, the, the, the simple story is just land prices go up, so, you have, so that means land rents and land prices are higher, so it takes more capital, and t people tend to either, be, if they're not born rich, they accumulate ca capital over time. So the more the farm program benefits are capitalized into the assets, you need assets to run the farm. It's a, it's, that's the logic of it. Uh, and there's data that show that in various ways. I wanted to say something about the age distribution very quickly, Scott, because you have to be careful looking at those numbers. Uh, about four or 500,000 farms make a living farming. The other 1.5 million are part-time operations. Many of those, uh, farming turns out to be an ideal retirement occupation. So you end up with a bunch of people that are farming because they're retired. And so the average age is quite high. So what you want to look at is the younger partner, if you think about new and beginning farmers, the younger partner who may not be listed as the farm operator on the farm, that may be, still be granddad. Uh, and, and we know that most farmers are family operations. They are, uh, uh, and, and so you really need to get the family profile. I'm, I'm less uh, convinced than Vince is that, that uh, we, we, we're gonna be very effective at subsidizing entry into farming. That, that seems to me a, a sinkhole. There was also a lady in the back right there, yeah. Scott, that had a question. Um, I just wanted to thank the panelists for being here because this is the, the real farm economy. And I, I guess I just was curious about, um, I hear from lenders a lot. Um, you use the example of a low Texas cotton farmer and a lending institution came to me and they said, 100% of our cotton farmers lost money and we don't know how we're gonna cash flow them. Um, Access to credit's a big deal, and from all the lenders I'm hearing, it seems like it's getting worse and worse. So I just wanted to see if you had any comments. Yeah, two, two, two quick facts. It, it talk to somebody who lends to dairy farmers. It's even worse because it's been going on for two or three years now. Uh, prices were high in 2014. They collapsed. In, and those are where, where we have monthly data on the dairy side. It, it, uh, so that's right. Farming, in, farm, particularly net cash income, particularly if you take particular commodities, dairy, cotton, et cetera, they go up and they go down. Uh, lenders are in it for the long haul, so are farmers. So if you talk to those guys, uh, they're not gonna lend somebody on today's cash flow necessarily, but, but they're gonna want that to be a secure operation. 
The other part of it is that, and, and this came up uh, for commercial farms, uh, the debt to equity ratio is remarkably small compared to most businesses. So there is lots of equity in those businesses. And, it, and, and that, that's fairly important for lenders. But you're right, uh, if, if the crop isn't gonna have a positive cash flow, that's a signal that the market doesn't want that commodity from that area, right? And so we do have to be a little careful, and the banker has to ask themselves, do I really want to lend money to a guy to grow cotton when the market's pretty clear uh, they don't want cotton from a farm that has cost of production above the price? Well, I think that most people are below cost of production in cotton farming. A lot of that has to do, I think, with probably what China has been doing. But in a, in a situation where you have few other crops you can plant, such as in West Texas, um, then what do you do? Because the farm economy touches a lot of other things. It touches small mainstream businesses, it touches implement dealers, it touches cotton gins, it touches grain elevators. So if that's the farm economy, I mean, in a place like that where there's not a lot of other crops you can plant, you know, what, not, not what's a guy to do, but um, I would think that things just seem, they don't seem hunky-dory. No, they're not. Um... Uh, everybody's been talking about their heritage around here. Uh, 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 my grandfather went belly up with cattle in West Texas. Uh, and in fact, a lot of that ground was, was cattle country uh, rather than cotton until, uh, Joe and I dispute the history here a little bit. I say until we had a cotton program. Joe says in, until Bull Weevil uh, uh, wiped out the East. But, but there's a history there. And, and you know, there's, there's rice land in California that's probably not gonna be rice in a few years, and there's probably cotton, and we know cotton acreage has come down over the last decade as well. So we're, what, uh, um, probably 60, 70% nationally in cotton acreage. California went from 1.5 million acres of cotton down to, uh, of upland cotton this year at 45,000. So basically the industry left. Is that good? Um, Probably so in economic terms. It probably isn't a region where you wanted to be growing cotton by world standards. And, and will that happen in West Texas? Probably not. But will there be years they, they don't make money? Certainly. And did the land go out of production? Yeah, that's another question. Well, uh, it did. I mean, they, they went into That's right. Went into that's right. Crops. So that, that'll have to be our last word. I want to make perspective. You folks have to listen to the. Uh, just a couple of things.